you stretch your muscle and I think if it's, if it's elements within the muscle itself, you kind of get some improvement by contract relax or hold relax or whatever you're using. What had happened if you saw that patient at the end of the day? Would they be back to the same level? I've done that and they were. So I get people stretching a little bit and I sort of think that they increase their flexibility a bit. But is it going to look all that much when after 10 treatments at whatever cost this is, we've made like an inch difference? How's that going to look when we start sort of trying to take it to the paying agencies? Unless they understand that this probably makes a huge difference to this patient in terms of their functional flexibility, it doesn't look much in terms of actually what we've done. So here's a challenge for us all, and I think in, you know, within, within our group we should be perhaps looking around and seeing and you know, perhaps trying some of these things out if we can have them on a trial or return basis. And then if we get something good is to ring around and say, this is it. This is the definitive piece of equipment. So long as it's not Steve that's telling us, because he's just made one. <laughs> he's trying to get us to buy it. <laughs> but I think, you know, the, the, you, you'd, think, you'd think it'd be out there, wouldn't you? You look at um, this spinalator, just a little joke. Uh, <laughs> you look at this spinalator of Gratovetsky. This was a piece of equipment that Farfan told me, you know, we've got this black box, it's coming out, you'll just do this and you'll do that. And I said, well, how much is it going to be, Harry? <laughs> I was on first day basis with him at this time. Um, and he said to me, oh, I don't know, it should be about fourteen, fifteen thousand $15,000. When the thing came out, it's like $150,000. Beautiful thing, Yeah, <laughs> it needs to be. <laughs> We'd have to work for a lifetime to, to even pay the interest on it in Canada at our rates. You know? So this is the problem. I don't know. Okay, let's, on that sad note, let's have a um, coffee and then we're going to do some um, sort of procedures around the hip. Finished yet? <laughs> or your coffees? Now, oh, only for a minute while people finish the coffee. But I don't want to spend any more time. Let's when we were doing our various evaluations there and we found altered movement what is the way that you differentiate between whether it's a muscle based loss of movement or whether it's a joint based what are the sort of easy ways here we are, we go into this. Is it the joint or is it the muscles that would do, if I'm coming into this, is it the muscles that would do that, that are tight? What's the differentiation that we can use to just try and evaluate this a little tiny bit? Okay, we could look at muscles, particularly if we've got, say, biarticular muscles. Or if we've got muscles which do several functions and what we can do is to try and reduce the action over one of their joints or we can perhaps try and alter the movement <clears throat> over one or two of their vectors. This of course we know isn't going to be absolute because joints tend to tighten up when we're using combinations of movement as well. So that's not going to be absolutely perfect. This is kind of good if we can do it. For example, a very quick example of this would be in the neck, wouldn't it? If I go across like this and I sort of think, okay, that's the restriction of movement. Is it joint or is it muscle? It's very easy for me to just take hold of the patient's arm and shorten the trapezius and if they can now get further or shorten the levator scapulae and they can get further, then of course it's going to be a joint-based problem. All right, so that, uh, sorry, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a muscle-based problem if they get further. Whereas if it makes no difference whether I shorten the muscle, then it's a joint-based problem. So this is kind of an easy way of going about this. Let me just repeat that, being as I screwed up there. <clears throat> okay, we go over to the left-hand side and it's restricted. Not sure whether it's joint or muscle. If I shorten the muscle there like this and the patient can get further, it was the muscle that was influencing it. If the patient, it makes absolutely no difference when I've 
shorten these muscles, then the chances are, particularly if I then try and push up a little bit with the first rib as well, so I get the scalenes, and it makes absolutely no difference, then it's probably a joint-based problem. So we can look at that. Is there any other way that you have of trying to judge whether it's muscle or whether it's joint? Okay, we could do one or two muscle-based procedures and look at the effect of that. Is there anything early before we sort of get too much into sort of like a treatment possibility? Yeah, we look for glides. And if we find that a joint is restricted, or the motion is restricted, and we look at the glides and the glides are perfectly normal, the chances are that it's not going to be the joint. Whereas if the glides are restricted, it could also be muscle as well under those circumstances, okay? But if glides are normal in the event of altered movement, then we think in terms of muscle. If glides are affected, we're not sure. We certainly know the joint's not contributing its fair share, and it could be that the muscle wasn't as well. But we can perhaps go back into this biarticular business then and try and sort that one out as well. Or do what Brian suggested, to do some muscle-based techniques and then to do some glides and see if we can compositely improve this um, phenomenon. Okay, I'd like to go now and have a look at one or two of the mobilizing and also the manipulating things as far as the hip is concerned. Now, in general terms, we're not really going to manipulate the hip. The bigger the joint, the less is the possibility of manipulating. Because when we manipulate a joint, we're looking at the restoration of glides or we're looking at the slight gapping in the joint. Those are the two things we're trying to do with a quick little movement to restore translation or to restore separation. And we'd only be doing it when we'd got the last little bit of restriction of range, like a couple of degrees or three degrees, and in a big joint that does a lot of movement, it's very difficult to know at that point. Whereas a joint, let's say the cuneiforms against the navicular, then they're always going to be amenable so long as it's not an active inflammatory process, because if we go on joint movement, because the movement's so small anyway, we're only ever dealing with one or two degrees. So manipulation to restore position for those would be probably feasible. So with the hip joint, as far as manipulating is concerned, we probably find there's only really one time we'd use this, and this is where we've got a loose body. And this will be a form of manipulation which doesn't look much like we try and do with the spine and stuff. It's one of Syriax's repetitive mobilizations and it's a good technique if you ever find somebody with a twinging hip that it locks and then it unlocks and perhaps you can help them or show one of their family members how to do this from time to time so you're not having to do it yourself all the time. So, I'd like to have a look at some techniques of mobilizing, because that's the fundamental here, and you know a lot of those, and some techniques, or one technique of manipulating, and then just to try and sort out one or two of the very best stretching techniques in this area for the key muscles, such as psoas and the rectus and the iliacus and the adductors and the hamstrings and so on. And so we can just sort of try and put that little bit all together in this composite form for this particular course. So, Let's just go to the beds for a second and just have a look at one or two techniques. I'll bring my bit of paper here so I don't forget any of them. All right. Right, Steve. It's your moment in the sun here. <laughs> you look as if you need to lay down. <laughs> okay. Now, one of the things that um, we've never followed particularly, but it's certainly followed as far as the uh, European 
Norwegian system is concerned, and it's a kind of a disciplined approach, and it's fine, I suppose, is to look at glides in the resting positions, and then go and look at glides and distraction in the restricted ranges. We tend to just say, look, if it's restricted, why are we doing it in its neutral position? Just go to the restriction and do some of the procedures. But they look at the neutral position and learn it, and everybody's happy with that, and then they go to the sort of pathological states, and that forms the next level up. And certainly you get people that technically can do things in an excellent way. All right. Now, as far as the hip joint is concerned, to look at the glides first, or to look at the distraction of the hip joint, we can do this in three ways. Okay, and I'm sure that all of you are familiar with all these things, so we can go over these fairly quickly. First of all, let me take the neutral position of the hip and come into a position where if I've tested out the knee and there's no problem with the knee, then I would start to do my distraction in this way, like this. If there is a problem with the knee, then I'm going to have to hold above the knee like this to do my separation techniques. Now, it would be better, and I have the central pillar, <laughs> which I'm going to put my arm down there like that, okay, and then the patient is encouraged to just slide down onto the pillar, make sure that nothing vital is trapped in between the pillar and their body, but generally speaking it's funny, Very nobody's ever complained about it, because they just move to the side and it actually engages more or less on the ischial tuberosity and on the ramus, so it's very very useful just to put this pillar in there. And then I don't have to worry about moving the spine into side flexion towards that side and compensation. This blocks that. In the event of not having that, then some of the belts that OTP make and so forth that come around here and come around the end of the bed, they're perfectly satisfactory as well. But this pillar is very useful without a lot of complicated pushing around. <coughs> And, you know, on any of these tables, I mean, somebody could bore a hole in here and just put a little bracket underneath and have something that just fits in. I mean, even on these kinds of tables, you could do that. <coughs> now, so we will do a distraction, a long axis distraction, which appears to be the very best way of getting maximum separation of the head of the femur in the, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in the acetabulum. Okay? The next thing is to do this in its ideal position theoretically, which doesn't happen to be the best position as far as experience is concerned, which is to take the leg in this position here, to come up on as high on the femur as I can get here, to remember the angle of the 120 degrees angle of the femur, neck of the femur, and then to pull like this. Now what's very important, and I'd like to stress this, is that we don't keep our shoulders still and do that. It's definitely moving like this, so that I'm not getting this kind of angulation and getting this tilt. It's got to be a whole thing coming out like this, not just doing it in that fashion. And the next one would be to do a distraction along the long axis, or in the direction of the long axis, but with the leg in this position here. So I can get right up there, and once again, I'm coming down with my arm and my body moving together, so that the fem femur isn't being angled into more flexion. So this is distraction in leg straight, out to the side, and with the leg up at 90 degrees. Sometimes that's a little easier to handle. And indeed, we might be thinking this would be a fairly ubiquitous technique to do as a starting procedure. And then let's say with Steve that when we did the various tests, we noticed that he had some loss of medial rotation. 
So traction is a thing that will always put stress on the specific structures if we put the structures towards that restricted range. So that with Steve here, I would go into medial rotation like this and then do a separation, knowing full well that I've tightened up the capsular structures into medial rotation and they're showing that they don't want to go any further but then by separating the joint here I'm putting a stress on those structures so this is the modification of distraction to take it into the stiffer range and then just simply put a distraction on at that stiff range which of course opens up a great variety of things that we can do So, let's just do these three. I realize that you've all done these, but just so that we've got the finer points coming out here, and then we'll go on to sort of slightly more um, advanced techniques than this. So, we'll do the distractions first, and try and get that feel within the joint. And fasten the belt here. That will give us a little bit of stabilization, provided we can get that round that ischial and pubic uh, ramus. But also, of course, it's quite convenient for us to put the belt round ourselves and then get hold of the leg like this and just lean back on ourselves like this. This is not ideal because I can't tighten it up, but I'll just use it like this as a, just to uh, simulate that. And then I can come into these various positions. And the use of belts, I think, has been really popularized by the uh, Norwegian school who walk around with a belt around themselves all the time like a color sergeant in the army. <laughs> okay, and then come down here and then I can just, just lean back and I can put a fair amount of stress without a lot of stress on myself. And this is acting a little bit like one of those nader chairs on me, isn't it? That when I'm bent over here, I can feel this pressing in my back and it gives me quite a lot of support in a position which might be a bit tiresome for me if I were doing these all the time. I got a whole set of belts at one stage, it cost me about $20 from a wreckers yard. Just pick the um, um, stitching free on one end and then just sort of put, took them down to a, a shoemaker and he charged me about $5 to stitch them all together in length and so I got umpteen of these from a wreckers yard for $20 as opposed to what we have to pay if we go to you know, standard places and buy these things. Okay, now as far as the rotational motions are concerned around the hip and the restoration of some of these other things, of course we can go in to doing some of the glides in any of these and I would just expect you to make these techniques up quite readily. Let's just have a look for a few that might be a little bit more um, complete than this. One would be on Kathy, and I'll do it on this side just for the sake of the... Um, camera would be the restoration of flexion. Flexion is one of these key features, isn't it, of the capsular pattern. And the capsular pattern in the hip, you see all kinds of variations. What is the capsular pattern of the hip as a matter of interest? Yeah, gross loss of flexion, internal rotation and abduction. So the way that people walk with an osteoarthritic hip that's well developed is an absolute perfect example. The leg's in here, it's pulled out there, it's a little bit of flexion, and they kind of walk like this with the Trendelenburg, so they lean over the hip to shorten the length of the neck, and they kind of walk like this movement. So that's the absolute idea, but of course, we don't have, oh, not the ideal, but the full developed thing. But of course, we see all kinds of variations on this little thing. And what I was saying to you earlier, I think, is a very valid point. That you look at someone like this and you go into this position here and you stress it out and we hold down here so we don't get all these extra movements. And I look at this and I can't find very much. Or I take it into what seems to be the full movement and push back here so that I'm not dealing with a lot of soft tissue that's getting in my way and I can't feel anything. I come into this position here and I have a look at medial rotation and it doesn't show up. But lo and behold, I come into this position which has got nothing to do with the capsular pattern as prescribed by Syriax and I find that that shows it up more. 
Now, one of the things I think we should remember about a capsular pattern is that perhaps there are six movements that we could do in any joint. Syriacs happen to look at three of them and say that these were the three worst. It doesn't mean that all the others are normal, and particularly if we do them in combinations. So, when we look at this particular movement, I feel that early capsular patterns show up a little bit earlier with this movement, which has got the features opposite to what we would consider, than if we're looking for subtle changes in medial rotation and even medial rotation in a flexed position like this. So, when we start to look for sort of mobilizing all of these movements, if we come into a flexion movement like this, and we're kind of thinking of a spin, but we're also thinking of a slight downward movement as I come up here of the spherical head of the femur, I can come up into this position here, take my hands around here, and do a backward gliding motion in the hip. If I've got my pillar, which is sort of stuck down here, and Kathy's moved on to it, so what I do now when I push down is not to get quite as much motion of just side bend of the spine, as you can see here, if I've got some block there and I push down. The other way of doing this one, which is quite reasonable to do it here, is actually to go into this position and to face down and to put your hand round on the ischial tuberosity and just to push down in that pattern as I'm doing here. So those are two hand grips of variations on the same theme of getting more flexion by taking it up to the flexion range and then just gliding down the femur so we simulating that downward movement. But of course, we don't get very much downward movement, but this seems to work moderately well. If we look at the limitations of extension now, can you roll onto your stomach a sec, Kathy, please? And I'll just get my wedge. I can move the leg into extension, like this, and hold it there, and I'll put a pillow, if I can just take this thing, sir. So that we're not putting a lot of extension strain on the knee. And then I can think about that sort of forward movement of this. I don't want to just increase the motion in the um, spine, so I'm going to sort of hold down on the base of the ischium here, which was all part of our testing, come into here and then just start pushing the head of the bone forward, like that. So this is one way of doing it. Or I can do the reverse of this, which is to hold it into this position, come onto the acetabular, or oh, come onto the acetabular side of the joint, and actually do it in reversed action, which is a thing that we'll do much more around the knee than we do here. But this is another way of getting that motion. So either hold here and push down there, or do the reverse action. Just sort of work on that a little bit. The next thing that we can do is this. Can you come to the end of the table here, Kathy, and just let me put you over this stool on with the other leg. So kind of just kneel on there. Let's just see how this works out. If not, I'll let you leg put your leg. Yeah, that'll be good. Now, I can come up into this position here. Wrap this around so it supports. Now I'd need to tighten it up so that it's held at this position here. Come into there like that, and now I can take it up into extension and push down here. And we've managed to sort of eliminate a lot of unnecessary movement in the lumbar spine and so on. So I can come up to the limit of the extension, and now I just take hold of the upper end of the femur and push it into that range there. So we had the flexion techniques where we looked for that downward movement. We look at these extension techniques here, and we look for that limited forward movement that encourages extension. 
Okay? And lastly, if you could go back, Kathy, when I've disconnected from you. Thank you. And just onto the bed here. On your own bed. Oh, no, on your stomach. Is the use of the forbear position and the use of sort of an extreme position when we come into this position. So let us say that we've got some limitation of external rotation. So I can hold the hip in this position of external rotation. I can take hold of the ilium like this and I can push the ilium down and forward like this, which is increasing the external rotation on the hip without sort of folk to, uh, sort of talking around too much on this long lever here. So I'm using very short levers, which gives me more control. So I can go into gaining more external rotation there. And this one, I can come into the opposite range and I can make sure that I push back through the hip there. Which direction is your left hand going? The left hand is going downwards and forwards there. So I take up this, I look at the restriction here. This raises up in the air there, which is an external rotation. And if I take this forward, I'm going into more external rotation. This one, no, this is going to into external rotation here, isn't it? As I, yeah, yeah, coming into that sort of range. So we just take it into the extreme anyway of its movement and then use this short lever technique there or come into this position here and I can come over the top here like this and just push back through that range there. The other way of doing that one is to come a little bit closer to me, is to come here, hold it like this, pick up the front of the ilium like this, hold her in that position and just do that movement like that. I think you might see a small mistake on that uh, video because I'd, sh I'd showed the same technique uh, on both sides and you picked that up, Pat, that was good. So this is what we're looking at for the medial rotation. I'm taking it into medial rotation. I just have to just follow this down. I see what it does to the ilium, which is to roll it into the bed. So I simply hold it there, put my hand under the ilium and pull it up away from the bed as I'm doing this. So this gives me the two extremes. This will give me medial rotation. When I come in to just review that, because I think I probably changed sides but didn't change technique, is to come into this way, see this coming up in the air, so I hold that in external rotation and just take this forward, which it increases the external rotation. And these are very controlled movements as opposed to trying to sort of do it through this long lever. The short lever techniques are very much superior. But make sure that you don't that you get as close to the hip as you can so we don't put a great deal of torque on the sacroiliac joint on this side. So you've got to feel the end range there and we should still be in a moderately good position for the sacroiliac joint and then I can just do this and the stress should be across the front of the hip. So just in to revise what we did here, could you lay on your back? Uh, we did a technique of coming up here and just pushing down or I came into this position and pushed down like this, which means that I can really block the ischium. We then did the extension techniques where we went onto the front, 